Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna to be talking about how analog to digital converters actually work and how you can use them in your PCB. Now, in this video, I wanna go over some of the finer points with using analog to digital converters. We're not gonna actually dig into all the different types of analog to digital converters, but it's more about how to prepare your design with an ADC so that you can properly sample the signal that you need to sample and then of course how you can prepare the board to ensure that you lay it out properly to have low noise. So we're going to show some examples in All Team Designer. You'll actually get to see some sample circuits with an ADC and an isolated ADC and I'll give you some overview of how to use all these different components. Let's get started. Now, I'm in Altium Designer right now, and I've created just a little test schematic here that contains two different types of ADCs and a power supply and some connectors. And so if I just zoom in on this one ADC, this ADC 128S102 from Texas Instruments, you can see that there's a number of different pins on this component. Here we see that we have a 3V3 supply coming into these two pins. And then if you're familiar with these other pin names, you'll see that this is a SPI interface. And then we actually have multiple inputs that are available on this particular ADC. I think it's important to note First, of course, what the ADC is actually doing, and then, of course, what all these different pins mean in order to ensure that you are using the ADC correctly. One of our goals in this video is to ensure that we prepare this type of schematic with everything that we need so that we can sample the signal with the highest possible accuracy. So first things first, how do ADCs actually work? And what are some of these important pins? Well, I think first things first, it's actually important to go over what some of these different pins mean, and then we can get into what the ADC is actually doing. So if you look at the typical pin out for an ADC, this just happens to be a maximum integrated ADC, you'll see that we have a few important pins. So one is the analog input. So we're actually inputting an analog signal, and then we're going to get a digital output. So the analog input is normally marked A in. And here, this analog input can actually be differential. So you see here we have an ANP and an ANN. That means we have a differential input. So one of these is the positive pin, and then pin 11 here is the negative pin. Now the digital output you can see is marked up here, D in and D out. And then we also have a digital IO reference that might be set just using the VDD pin here. So the VDD pin here uh, on the digital side, that normally just powers the digital subsystem inside of the component. But sometimes you'll also see like an IO VDD pin. And that sets the voltage level for the digital bit stream that you're going to get out of this ADC. Then the other important pin here is the VREF pin. There's another power pin that you need to connect in some of these components, and that VREF pin sets the reference for the analog signal. And I'll explain what that means here in just a moment when we talk about quantization. But this VREF pin could be named VREF P or VREF N, meaning that the VREFERENCE can also be differential. And so if you look down here on pins 13 and 14, you will see that we have REF P and REF N. So REF P and REF N are our analog input references. So we have a positive and a negative. So this allows us to set the measurement range for that analog signal that we want to measure. And we can set that range between some minimum and maximum value. You could set it between, let's say, negative three and positive three. That means you're trying to measure some analog signal that has a maximum peak to peak voltage of up to six volts, ranging between negative three and positive three volts. So that setting for the V reference pin is also very important because it needs to be very quiet, which means it needs to be placed and routed properly. You'll see some other pins here, like here we have a CLK pin. So this clock is for an external clock that's going to allow you to set the sampling rate in this ADC. And then you have some other pins here that are particular to this component. And of course, you can read up on those in the data sheet. So now that we know what these individual pins are, we know that we're giving this component an analog input and then we're getting a digital output from it. Let's look at what the ADC is actually doing with all of this stuff. So here in this slide, what we're looking at is a process called quantization. And essentially what the ADC is doing is it's taking this input colored signal and then it's sampling it at different points in time. 
And at each point in time, it's converting the real voltage on that signal into a number. And so there's some scale here defined between V ref N and V ref P. So this signal is supplied to the ADC with voltage lying between V ref N and V ref P. And if V ref N is not specified in your ADC, most likely it's just zero volts or whatever this A, G, and D potential is here. In this case, it's A, V, S, S, but A, G, and D potential. And that's what's going to define the measurement range for the input analog signal. Now, at each point in time, you're converting this output into a digital number, and it is this digital number that's encoded as a binary bitstream that's gonna, then gonna be output from this component through its digital interface that we see here in the top half of the component. So that's basically what the ADC does. And there are different ways of sampling each of these points in time, and there are a number of different circuits. And in fact, I'll link to an article in the description that describes what the ADC is doing and what different types of ADCs are actually doing, because there are different methods for doing this quantization. So what this quantization process does is it breaks this entire range between VREF P and VREF N into a set of discrete voltage levels that are spaced by delta V. So it's important to know what this value of delta V is because that's gonna help you quantify exactly how much resolution you have in your system and then you'll need to actually compare that with the amount of noise that you can expect in your system to ensure that you don't actually use too high of a resolution in your ADC. So let's say I have a 10-bit ADC. So if I have a 10-bit ADC, how many possible voltage levels can I encode here between VREF P and VREF N? Well, if I have 10 bits, that would be 2 to the 10th power number of states. So that would be 1,024 possible states. If the difference between VREF P and VREF N is 5 volts, my range would be here, 5 volts. And so then... Delta V would be 5 divided by 1024, because I have 1024 spacings here. So taking 5 divided by 1024, you see that we get 4.8 millivolts. We'd have 4.88 millivolts spacing between all of our different levels here. So that's important because that's going to determine the smallest features that you can measure in an input waveform. And it's also going to need to be compared with the noise that you can expect in your system. Because if your noise is too high, you actually might start measuring the noise in your ADC. And maybe you don't want to measure the noise. So this is something to think about. So let's take a look at an example here with this kind of low level waveform here. So here, with this low signal level, you can see that this particular waveform that I would like to sample has pretty low dynamic range. Basically, what this means is that with this low of a signal level, and if this is all of my states lined up here on the left, that I really only have four states worth of resolution. And so in this middle region of this waveform, where the amplitude is really low, you actually can see that I won't really be able to sample this very well and get very accurate measurements of what the waveform is actually doing. Some of this variation might be so small that it sits between these two states. And so as a result, it actually doesn't get measured by the ADC. So when you're using an ADC, it's important to actually ensure that you match this VREF P range to VREF N range to the signal level that you want to measure. So you want to fill up the dynamic range of this signal within this range VREF P minus VREF N. Basically what that means is that if you have a low level signal like this, then you wanna amplify it so that it gets like this. And that's what's gonna allow you to measure these very small features in this input waveform. So if you have a waveform like this where you do have these small features that you need to measure, then you need to make sure that you have enough resolution to actually measure that part of the waveform. So that's the importance of resolution, and it's going to determine what level of signal variation you can measure on your input waveform. However, in some cases, too much resolution can actually be bad, especially when you start considering noise. Let's just suppose here, in this example, that I have a signal that I would like to measure from, let's say, this point to this point, and I want to measure this sine wave. But this sine wave has some background noise that's superimposed on it. So I've separated the two in this image just to kind of illustrate the noise level compared to the signal level. 
So here you could say that we have really high signal to noise ratio. And the noise is low enough that it's only influencing an error of about plus or minus one state. So that's pretty accurate, especially when you consider the number of possible states in an ADC. So with this signal level being very high compared to the noise, you could use either a high resolution or a low resolution ADC. And so you can already see that if I were to say, take the resolution of this ADC and maybe cut it in half, well, now what happens to the noise? Now the noise, same noise level, is actually sitting totally between two states for the ADC's digital conversion. And so what that means is that it's not going to induce any error. The noise is so low that the ADC doesn't even register it on the digital output. In this case, sometimes low resolution is actually desirable. And you can really see that this is the case, of course, when you have lower signal to noise ratio. Because if I have a lower signal to noise ratio, it's actually gonna be very helpful to then go to a somewhat lower resolution, and I would want to ensure that the signal that I want to measure still fills up the dynamic range that's defined by the difference between VREF P and VREF N. We wanna make sure that the noise that we wanna measure sits within a small number of states for this ADC's resolution. And so here, by just taking the resolution and cutting it at half, I've gone from plus minus four states to maybe plus minus one state, something like this. So low resolution can reduce error and in cases when you have high noise. So where can noise come from? Noise can be on the signal, so meaning that the signal that is provided to your circuit board can have some noise on it. The noise can be received on the analog line as crosstalk. If you have something like a multi-channel ADC, such as what I showed here in Altium Designer, if one of these inputs was at very high frequency or if it was at very high power, it could actually induce crosstalk into one of these other inputs. And for that reason, you sometimes wanna use an ADC that actually multiplexes its sampling so that you only have one analog signal being read out at a time rather than both of them. You could also filter these different inputs. So you could actually apply a filter to try and remove some of this noise. And then there's another technique called oversampling. So oversampling followed by anti-aliasing will actually cut down the noise because it spreads that noise power out of broader bandwidth and then it cuts off part of that bandwidth. And so that process will also reduce noise. So the other thing that I think is important is that the reference carrying noise means that you have to design your power supply for your reference in order to provide low noise. What types of references can you use? Well, you can use a standard power supply if you want, and that even means you could use a switching regulator. Now, if you do use a switching regulator, the switching noise is then going to appear on the VREF pins. So that's actually a bad thing because now your reference is actually quite noisy, and you would wanna make sure that you apply the proper filtering to get that noise level down. And if you do use filtering, you wanna make sure that you don't use something that then adds a pole into the transfer function for that filter. Because then at one particular frequency, you can get very strong transient response at that particular frequency. That's actually very bad for noise. So trying to put a filter on a standard power supply, like a switching power supply, is probably not the best strategy if you need to get very accurate measurements with an ADC. So instead, we actually have something called precision references, and these are sometimes called band gap references. So precision reference voltage sources have two important characteristics. The first is that they produce a very stable voltage, and by stable, we of course mean very low noise. But the other thing that's actually very important is that they have very low temperature drift. So the rate at which that voltage output changes with temperature is very low, compared to something like a standard LDO or maybe a switching regulator or some other power source that you might use in your design. So precision reference voltages are actually very useful if you need to get very accurate measurements. So now let's take a look at some precision reference examples. So here I'm just gonna go to Octopart and I'm gonna put in precision voltage reference. So this is what you wanna search for if you wanna find one of these references. Let's take a look at this one. So this particular voltage reference from analog devices, um, this part number you can see here, outputs at five volts, and this is at five volts DC. 
Now, if we just open up the data sheet here, we'll be able to get some of the specs on this thing. So these components are pretty small. You can see it's just an eight lead SOIC. There's this alternative five lead package here as well. And then here you can see what the temperature coefficient is. So if you need to have very high accuracy down to very stable voltage levels over a range of temperatures, then this is the component that you wanna to use to set your analog reference. And so you can see here for this particular example, we have three parts per million per change in temperature. So that's extremely small change in the output voltage. That's like one millionth of whatever this nominal output is per degree change in temperature. In order to get up to even a millivolts worth of voltage change, you'd have to change the temperature of this component by much higher than its operating temperature. So you can essentially ignore that as a factor in whether or not this component is gonna experience any decay in accuracy due to the change in temperature. Now, you can also see that some of these have a wide operating range. There are others that are available that output at standard logic levels. So they'll output at 1V8, 2V5, 3V3, whatever else you need. So this is a good example of a component that you would wanna use if you want to get very accurate measurements. And this particular component is actually, you can see here, qualified for automotive. So the next thing that we need to think about in using an analog to digital converter is filtering. How can we filter this input signal to ensure that number one, we remove some of the noise, but also number two, to ensure that we do not in create aliasing during the process of sampling. And then of course, if we do need to filter our input signal, where do we put the filter? Should we put it near the ADC or near the source? The other factor that is related to filtering is actually the impedance of the source. So your analog source or the source of the analog signal that you wanna sample, it will have some particular impedance and you need to then consider how do you apply filtering given the impedance of that analog source. So with a component like this particular component from Texas Instruments, where would we wanna put this particular filter? If we were going to filter this signal and it's coming off of an SMA going into this ADC, we would wanna put the filter right here near the pin. And so there are a couple of reasons for that. But the main reason is that we wanna ensure that after we filter the signal, we of course don't receive any more noise on that analog line before sampling the signal. So we would wanna put it close to that pin. Just to see some more uh, information about the impedance issue, we can actually take a look at the data sheet for this particular component, because they have a really good diagram that shows how to handle high impedance versus low impedance sources. Going into the data sheet for this ADC, you can see right here that if we're gonna use a low impedance source, we can just go straight through an anti-aliasing filter and this anti-aliasing filter is simple. It's just an RC filter. It's this 100 ohm resistor and this 33 nanofarad capacitor. But if we're dealing with a high impedance source, the simplest thing that you can do is you can actually just put this through a buffer. So we have an op amp here that's just being used as a buffer. And then you can see here that we've set the, the top rail to five volts the same level that we've set for the analog input voltage. So that's very important because we wanna make sure that we don't rail out that op amp in the process of using it. So we wanna set the voltage rail for that op amp at least as high as the analog voltage that we're using for the analog supply on the ADC. And then we can just connect that output directly over here to this anti-aliasing filter. And so this anti-aliasing filter then just goes straight into this input. When we have this high impedance source, we're essentially just using this buffer as a separation between that high impedance and then whatever the output impedance is set through this anti-aliasing filter. This filter here is essentially a low pass filter. And then of course we wanna ask, well, where should we cut off this filter? What value do we use to set the bandwidth for this channel? So in setting the bandwidth, they actually have cited a universal relationship here, which is called the Nyquist criterion. So the Nyquist criterion is very important because this says that in order for your analog signal to be sampled accurately, the sampling rate, Fs, has to be greater than or equal to double whatever the bandwidth or the frequency of your signal is. You have to have some minimum sampling rate in order to 
accurately resolve the signal that you're trying to sample. Otherwise, you get a phenomenon called aliasing. So I'll invite you to Google aliasing to learn about it, but it is related to the ADC sampling rate. So based on this bandwidth that we need in this channel to accurately sample the signal, we can then use that to figure out what is the bandwidth that we need in the channel for a single ADC. So in this case, they are using a factor eight reduction here in the bandwidth that they would need because they have eight channels in this ADC. So typically with a single channel ADC, you can just set the bandwidth to be less than half of this limit or half the sampling rate that we've defined in this limit. It's gonna work just fine. You don't have to set it lower than that. But make sure that you filter exactly to the point that you need so that you can cut out as much noise as possible and so that way it doesn't create inaccuracies in that digital conversion process. So inside of this schematic, what we'd wanna do is, of course, we would need to know what is the voltage level and the frequency that we need to sample here. It's good in your schematic to note specifically what is the signal level that we need to sample, and in this case, it's zero to five volts. It's at 10 milliamps. But then you would, of course, want to ask what is the frequency as well. So it's important to, when you're creating your schematics, note that this is going to be some frequency, let's say two kilohertz. If you then need to verify any filter that you put on this line, you can then verify that it actually does have the cutoff at two kilohertz right where you need it. Same thing here, if you were gonna use this isolated ADC, you wanna have a note here, and then of course you wanna put some kind of note on the frequency that you're gonna use to ensure that anyone else that's looking at this schematic knows exactly where they need to apply any filtering, and then they can go ahead and do that. Now, you might be wondering, just on this particular example, why did we not apply any filtering on the output beyond just these two capacitors? Well, the reason for that is this is actually an LDO, and this particular LDO is a very low noise regulator. I've used it in the past in other projects. I was introduced to it through one project and found that it worked so well that decided to use it in other projects. And here, we're just fine with having these output capacitors. Now, if you were gonna use a switching regulator and trying to filter the switching regulator noise, you could then use like a pie filter, but you have to be very careful when you design that pie filter to ensure that you don't create a new transient response or a new pole in that filter's transfer function that could then interfere with this analog supply that you have on your ADC. All right, everybody, thanks for sitting through this tutorial on ADCs. Hopefully this illustrates how they work and what you as a PCB designer need to know in order to work with ADCs properly. In an upcoming video, we're gonna introduce what exactly are isolated ADCs. We're gonna show a little bit more how to use ADCs in a PCB properly and some layout and routing considerations. And then this circuit that you saw here on screen in Altium Designer, I'm actually gonna do an example layout with that schematic and you'll be able to see what it looks like when you have both a non-isolated and an isolated ADC in the same board. Thanks for watching everybody. Hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. Of course, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah.